when I look at a presentation like the last one, I realize that today we can, we can sense, we can, so to speak, suck things out of the brain. Uh, it's probably not a too distant future when we'll be able to put things into it. Uh, so while I and others work on learning and so on, I can imagine a distant future where you put on something like that and uh, it takes everything that you and I have taken a lifetime to learn and squirts it into somebody's head. Uh, I and at least two other speakers will talk uh, directly or indirectly about one laptop per child, which certainly fits the theme of trying to change the world. Uh, some of us, I'll speak for myself, uh, actually wake up in the morning and we ask ourselves, are we changing the world? And I ask myself a subset of that question every morning, and that is, is what I'm doing today something that will happen through normal market forces? And if the answer to that question is yes, then stop. Because what I should be doing, my colleagues at MIT should be doing, and my colleagues at One Laptop Per Child were doing, were things that the market forces would not do, for one reason or another. And our view of changing the world was a very particular one. We talked about children and learning, but what we didn't say at the beginning, and I'd like to sort of make it a theme for today, is that we didn't tell people outright that the way we were going to change the world was by having children change the world. And that's a very important difference because most people, when you talk about learning, and most people will use the word education and even more will use the word school, <clears throat> the image is that you are basically giving children information and they are going to learn and then change the world versus thinking that children are in fact the teachers and that by teaching even at the age of five and six you are in fact engaged in the most profound learning possible but you also are affecting your self-esteem if you will and as a consequence uh, you're learning a lot more. So the theme for today, because I talk an awful lot about one laptop per child, and several of you, particularly those who were here last year, have heard this stuff many times. And I said, well, today the theme is what does it mean to be child-centric? And I'm sure Walter, who is the speaker after next, will talk about that. Uh, and I want to just keep it at the forefront of your mind. And I have three slides to start off with that to me were the most meaningful images of the unfolding of one laptop per child. And one of the things that's very important to know is that there are over two million of them out there now. So the project isn't a theoretical one, it's not one of intention, it's not one of promise there are over two million in the hands of kids in roughly 40 countries, roughly 25 languages. So, <clears throat> so now what, what have those laptops shown us? And everybody says to me, have you measured the results? Uh, and it's very interesting. My first answer to somebody is, is if you have to measure a result, it's not big enough. I can't tell you how unpopular that is. The few of you who are clapping, it's not a popular position because forget the arrogance of it, but the reality of it. I don't want to measure things because the things that are really important are quite obvious. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit more. But when I see a picture like this, this to me is very important, partly for reasons you cannot possibly know. 
The first being that this man had never used a computer in teaching. He's a primary school teacher in India. He always taught with the children lined up in perfect rows, sitting there, stones, corporal punishment was part of the program. Uh, you really didn't want to ask a question because of the fear of being wrong. This is the way he teaches now, and this is what teaching has become. Those kids run to school. The parents hang in the windows looking at what's going on in school. It's a completely different environment. That's what one laptop per child does. That's the result we want. And when some of our colleagues who say they're, quote, competing with us, which usually means that the marketing company of some computer vendor thinks education's a good market, what do they do? They go into school, like going into a bank, looking at what the customer, the teacher, wants, automate the process, and they fundamentally make no change in the process of schooling, but making it a little bit more efficient. This is fundamental transformational change. This picture is perhaps even more important because I am part of a group, a small group, that believe that children can do a great deal more learning on their own than we give them credit for. Most people do not credit children enough. We really don't, including our own children, sometimes especially our own children. The point being that a great deal of learning goes on, and this kind of collaborative learning where multiple kids are doing something is, again, very fundamental. And the identification of one laptop per child <clears throat> is indeed one laptop <clears throat> per child, which in its name suggests an isolation, which is perfectly fine in the sense that you want to have sometimes that kind of isolated access, of whether it's reading or searching data, <clears throat> but the group experience is also important. So when you have even just two children that are available to ask each other a question, just that alone, again, is very, very important. And this picture is the one that I show the most often. It's the most heartwarming <clears throat> because this child, along with and a lot of other children, in the remote parts of Peru are teaching their parents how to read and write. And if that doesn't put goosebumps on your goosebumps, I have nothing else to tell you. I think the idea that the child becomes the agent of change as opposed to just the object of change is, again, very, very fundamental. And if you're going to change the world, what better way to do it than have an army of people that happen to be children because it's replenished rather rapidly. It's the largest growing population uh, in those countries, obviously by definition. <clears throat> there are many of them, and I'm not going to get much further without water. Um, <clears throat> I'll keep trying uh, a little. So I'm going to show you what you may have seen, which was the first, the first laptop <clears throat> Thank you, I should have thought of this myself. Uh, the first laptop we showed with Kofi Annan way back five years ago, and the reason I pulled the image up is even though we didn't build it, it cast the right image. Cast an image of something that was toy-like, something that you cranked, obviously, with your hand, because there isn't electricity available to these kids. And it was designed from the bottom up. And the software, which was very much conceived and designed by Walter Bender, who's speaking later, the hardware was designed and conceived very much by Mary Lou, who's speaking later. So I won't talk much about it, uh, except to say um, two things. <clears throat> Most of you have seen it. Most of you have also seen me drop it. I love to do that. Um, in fact, <clears throat> I sometimes throw it into the audience, but it's dangerous. Uh, Intel likes to tell people they compete with us, and I found myself on panels with various senior executives of Intel, and, and I throw mine 
and after I do that, I say to them, now throw yours. <coughs> you know. <clears throat> the reason I, I stop on this image is that it's a games machine and a book, but I want to talk about books because if you put a hundred books in this laptop and then you ship a hundred laptops into a village, um, <clears throat> you can have a hundred different books on each laptop. So that means the village has 10,000 books. You and I didn't have 10,000 books when we went to primary school. And now an African village without electricity can have 10,000 books. And that's very important. It's not the whole story, but it's an interesting story because <clears throat> if you think of Africa that has in rough numbers 500,000 villages, India has a rough number, 500,000 villages, so that's a million of them, each with 10,000 books. <clears throat> There's no way in the world you can ship a million times 10,000 physical books. It'd be a stupid thing to do anyway, but it's no, you just can't do it. So the developed world will be way behind the developing world. The developing world will use electronic books more than we do, and just like cell phones, there are going to be more electronic books in Africa than there are in Europe because that's all they can use. And it's a very important point, and it's an important point for kids. Um, the antennas and the network we can talk about, or maybe Walter will talk about it in collaboration, about <clears throat> students collaborating. The rest of my, my presentation is derived from images that, that I'm bringing up mostly to remind me what to say, but I want to, to sort of, I've, I've said my words about measurement, so what will I, what do I want to measure? And sometimes people uh, say to me, well, you know, how do you know it works? Can you prove it works? <clears throat> and if I have the opportunity, I say, well, just come, come take a peek. And you look into the classroom, and the energy in that classroom is very different. Now, it doesn't have to be pandemonium, which is what you see here, <clears throat> but this particular classroom was, the teacher in the classroom had been teaching for 30 years, and the president of the country, this country's Uruguay, had said that every child in Uruguay would have a laptop within 18 months. And when that was said publicly, the teacher because she had been teaching 30 years, said, it's time for me to retire. <clears throat> so she goes to the Social Security office, asks for early retirement. They say, fine, come back in six weeks. So that's how long it takes to process it. And she goes back to her school, and in the intervening period, the laptops arrive in this room. And within a few days, she realizes the difference it makes. And she goes back to the Social Security, changes her mind, and asks for late retirement. Teachers constantly tell us they have never been so excited. It's not just the man you saw huddled with the students or this teacher in this classroom, but that it's a totally different phenomenon. And it's not that it destroys the teacher-child relationship, it just makes learning a very, very different process. Since Uruguay has done every child in the country, literally every child, they completed it a year ago, a tourist sent me this picture. <clears throat> Somebody actually I don't know who just took a picture because they were visiting Uruguay and started spotting the little green laptops all over the place. Um, <clears throat> this is in, in Peru, and the reason I'm interested in Peru is, again, they're the biggest. They hit almost a million this year. The reason I picked Peru is that the president of Peru decided to do the remote and rural children first. And that's fundamental for a number of reasons, because typically to be rural means to be poor. And in fact, the entire history of development is really the history of urbanization. As a country gets richer, it gets more urban, and people move from the villages where arguably they're poor, but it's not poverty. Poverty is worst in urban, urban poverty is the worst. 
and it's a man-made phenomenon and to be rural is to be primitive perhaps is the right word and many people left the rural to go for the promise of jobs promise of this promise of that and usually it did not happen so if you could invert the cycle and let the rural parts go first as President Garcia did in Peru you are at least reversing <clears throat> maybe stemming the tide maybe changing it and so that's one of the reasons I'm fascinated with Peru this picture was just sent to me it's so incredible I had to include it there's no real reason except that it's a really cute picture <laughs> um, China I, I put this there uh, our laptops are made in China but we don't do anything in China this is the village <clears throat> that was hit by the earthquake so we did something uh, in that village but China is an interesting problem it may become the wealthiest country and good for it uh, there's nothing wrong with it becoming the wealthiest country but I did meet with the president of uh, not president the minister of education of China and he looked at me straight in the face and he said professor Negroponte your laptop is child centric and our education system is teacher centric and hence it's not compatible well he has 220 million students <coughs> that were in his or under his aegis um, I did I was not going to argue with him but I went away and I realized the problem in China is nothing to do with democracy or with the fact that uh, the Chinese government uh, bans the Wikipedia or things like that problem in China is Confucius Confucius is the problem Confucius doesn't want a laptop in anybody's hand just think about it and it's was really an interesting India and I will end on India because almost 25 percent of the children of the world are in India it's kind of incredible Indians don't even know that most of the time the real number is about 23.5 it depends how you count there are about 50 million children that aren't even counted in India so it's hard to pinpoint it but it's a very big number China and India together certainly represent over 40 percent of the world's children and we have not penetrated either place so there's a lot a lot to go so what I'll say in my last few seconds uh, to, to close is that one laptop per child's success is not measured in the two or 2.5 million laptops that are out there in fact if I came back in six months and said to you guess what there are four million laptops out there so what the four million okay maybe four no no something else is going on and what's going on is and I think this is what I consider the great success is if you take the character string one laptop per child in lowercase put quotes around it and stick it into Google Alerts you get about 50 to 60 alerts a night and not that many of them less than half of them are us and that's the success and that's what I'm very proud of and that's what's going to change the world thank you very much